il y a assez longtemps, euh, mais mon très cher ami euh, Marc Haritonov a été ici comme lui aujourd'hui euh, pour quelques semaines, Julia Vapunina, et euh, je revois aujourd'hui le même euh, endroit paradisiaque qu'il y a, je ne sais pas combien, 15 ou 16 ans, euh, avec euh, Marc et sa femme, euh, qui est une artiste gagnante. Alors, euh, parler de Yulia est assez difficile. Euh, je n'ai pas lu tous ses livres, j'en ai lu quelques-uns suffisamment pour pouvoir en dire quelques mots, mais c'est un personnage assez compliqué euh, qui suscite de fortes réactions de ses lecteurs, de ses auditeurs, de ceux qui la regardent. Alors, par exemple, euh, avant de venir ici, j'ai regardé sa dernière émission euh, à la radio euh, Echo Moscou. Et comme euh, l'émission euh, est en, 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 en vision, disons, à travers son MacBook, j'imagine, qui est là, je la voyais et j'ai bien reconnu la Vigny. J'ai vu qu'elle parlait à la Vigny. Donc, elle fait de la Vigny des émissions qui sont émises à Moscou. Et beaucoup regardez. Son émission s'appelle Le Code d'entrée, Code d'Ost ou pas. Je ne sais pas, peut-être elle nous dira combien elle a d'auditeurs. Parce que. Sorry, I'll switch to English because my French is certainly not up to the task. Uh, we just been recently counting with uh, here is Dasha Varansova. She she is responsible for my YouTube, uh, uh, and uh, it looks uh, like this. So we have a very high rating uh, when it comes to audio, and Echo of Mos my uh, uh, my uh, show comes uh, Saturday night, and it has uh, around uh, 300,000 listeners to listen on uh, Saturday night uh, to the uh, uh, show. Uh, then there is around uh, 150 from uh, uh, thousand to 200,000 people who read the transcript. And then there's an additional something like, uh, I would say, from uh, 300 to 400,000 people that watch it on YouTube, both my YouTube and Echo Moscow YouTube. So the total, and uh, there are also <coughs> podcasts and repeats and blah, blah, and uh, we... we uh, trying to measure the audience and it's, it's well uh, more than a million which is uh, of course impressive because uh, you know uh, say just for the comparison uh, just right now uh, when people watch TV and TV is controlled by state uh, there's the most popular the most influential program uh, that is uh, a program of the state TV it's called uh, Le Temps, <laughs> the, the, the Time Uh, and uh, the average audience uh, right now is something like four to five million people. Uh, so obviously, uh, this is a big reach. Alors, euh, comme vous avez entendu Yulia, euh, euh, elle a un immense public. Elle mène une conversation avec euh, ce public, euh, en particulier à travers cette émission euh, Le Code d'entrée. Euh, qui porte sur euh, tous les sujets, donc euh, il ne peut pas être question de, de résumer, mais vraiment tous les sujets. Euh, Peut-être je me permets un mot pour dire que je l'ai rencontré il y a déjà très longtemps, elle était beaucoup plus jeune et moi j'étais beaucoup moins vieux, <rire> avec ses parents euh, que je connais bien, que j'apprécie énormément, euh, Léonide et Arla, Arla qui est plutôt euh, critique littéraire et Léonide qui est un romancier très intéressant et un, euh, un collectionneur aussi très intéressant. Euh, D'ailleurs, euh, leur maison, je la connais bien, elle est à côté de celle de, euh, du poète Maurice Pasternak euh, à Piridiorkino. Euh, C'est là qu'a eu lieu, je crois, l'incident qui fait que euh, Yulia Leonidovna a quitté euh, pour, pour un certain temps la Russie, puisqu'on a mis le feu à sa voiture qui était devant cette maison 
et ces maisons sont en bois, et par conséquent, les risques sont très grands. Euh, C'est son père, précisément, qui a éteint euh, l'incendie, elle, elle n'était pas là. Qui a fait cela Évidemment, il y a en Russie euh, des gens euh, qui sont des extrémistes, des fanatiques, des jusqu'au boutistes. Euh, il y a aussi certainement, je vois en lisant les commentaires, hein, des gens qui euh, ont du mal à supporter les... Euh, disons les pensées toujours euh, assez fortes, quelquefois provocantes de Yulia euh, dans ses livres et dans ses émissions, ça ne veut pas du tout dire qu'ils vont aller mettre le feu naturellement euh, à sa voiture. Elle a aussi eu des événements, euh, des incidents très pénibles pendant qu'elle passait dans Moscou. Une fois que je lui ai téléphoné, euh, j'ai entendu qu'elle avait du mal à souffler, j'ai compris qu'elle était à vélo, parce qu'elle est une grande sportive, et je viens de me dire qu'elle a fait toutes les environs de l'Avigny à vélo, elle est allée jusqu'à Genève à vélo. Alors, vous savez, elle est entrée en politique, au fond, à l'époque de Yeltsin, à une époque qui était une époque un petit peu chaotique, elle, je ne veux pas résumer ses thèses politiques, mais quand je les lis, elle me semble un peu proche de celle de mes amis défunts, Vladimir Volkov, euh, sur la désinformation. Et d'ailleurs, j'ai constaté que certains philosophes chinois de la désinformation euh, leur sont communs. Alors, elle écrit depuis... Euh, Bon, elle a commencé par être journaliste, économiste, faire des études avec Sivolod euh, Ivanov, qui était un remarquable savant et le fils d'un écrivain. Euh, Je n'étais pas sa soutenance, mais il y avait un de mes amis, Georgi Gatchev, et comme euh, c'est un personnage assez combatif, c'était un personnage combatif, je peux imaginer que la, la cérémonie a été assez combative. Au fond, elle écrit des, des thrillers économiques, et en particulier sur cette période de chaos euh, assez euh, vif qu'il y a eu dans les années 90, où l'on a beaucoup accusé le président Yeltsin je crois un peu à tort d'ailleurs. Comme on écrit de la science-fiction, je dirais qu'elle écrit de la finance-fiction, mais cette finance-fiction, elle porte sur euh, cette Russie-là. Elle n'est pas la seule, il y a des... Un certain nombre d'écrivains ont tenté de décrire cette période des killers, des liquidations de banquiers, des liquidations euh, d'hommes d'affaires. Ensuite, c'est le Caucase et c'est sa trilogie qui a été traduite et qui, vous avez euh, Caucasiopus euh, et deux autres, puis euh, son euh, best-seller, j'imagine, pour euh, l'instant, le meilleur livre, La chasse aux reines de Sibérie. Euh, que vous dire Son dernier livre m'a étonné. Alors, son dernier livre s'intitule euh, Issus. Et euh, je ne peux pas ne pas en dire un mot parce que c'est un livre qui est assez provoquant. Euh, L'histoire euh, de l'apparition euh, de Jésus de Nazareth et comment on se, euh, se comment dire, vu l'extérieur, ce prophète. Ce, ce petit prophète entouré de 12, puis 30, puis une centaine de disciples qui le suivaient partout, commence à se transformer en ce que c'est devenu dans un monde où il n'était pas le seul. Et euh, comme euh, nous avons en français, mais ça je ne pense pas que Yulia l'ait lu, deux énormes volumes de la Pléiade, l'un qui sont les écrits intertestamentaires, où vous avez les, euh, comment dire, 2000 pages, euh, d'évangile apocryphe, appelons-le. Et puis ensuite, 
il y a un tome de 2150 pages sur les apocryphes. Je vous dis cela simplement pour vous montrer euh, l'immensité euh, du problème et du monde qu'elle aborde, euh, qu aborde à sa façon. Parce qu'au fond, euh, elle regarde le monde comme un puzzle. Un puzzle que les, ceux qui dirigent euh, essayent de nous tromper en bousculant le puzzle. Et euh, elle refait le puzzle de l'histoire du Christ, de l'histoire des fanatiques, des Esséniens, de, dans le monde juif et ensuite dans le monde post-Christ. Euh, c'est la façon dont je vois une certaine continuité dans, dans ce qu'elle écrit. Alors, voilà, nous allons l'entendre, nous expliquer ce puzzle, comment elle le voit. Well, actually, I was not expecting to speak about Christianity. It would be a little bit presumptuous. So, I was told that I am, uh, once again, sorry for not speaking French. Uh, I mean, I will certainly, the, the quality certainly would be good. I will understand French, I'll ask, answer the questions. Uh, so, uh, I was told to speak a little bit about myself and to speak a, bit, a little bit about what I want to speak. Uh, obviously, one thing I cannot do is uh, to retell my novels because uh, uh, the uh, shortest way to retell any uh, literally text which is of importance is the text itself. Uh, so in retelling it just uh, loses everything. Uh, and uh, so uh, my, uh, my life is not pretty interesting. As I said, I was always a very bookish person. I was always just interested in uh, not in living my life but in looking around me and recording what's happened. Uh, so when I found myself unexpectedly Uh, partly a part of the events and not a describe of the events. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, I had uh, several uh, uh, problems. Uh, first, uh, uh, first there was a pail of a uh, sheet of food locked over me, uh, which was not scary at all because obviously if people want to, uh, to kill you, they don't drop uh, poo all, all over you. Uh, then unfortunately there was the metal, the brakes of my car. Uh, then there was an unfortunate story when uh, uh, somebody, uh, it was not exactly poisonous gas, it was mostly full smelling gas uh, that is uh, classified as a non-lethal uh, military weapon, military grade gas, uh, that was introduced into our home, uh, the very home uh, uh, Mr. Neva was speaking about, uh, which is uh, which we share with two families and which affected, uh, affected uh, my parents, among other things. Uh, so it was not a good story because my parents, as you can see, are obviously not very young. Uh, so then there was the matter of my car that was burnt, as uh, Mr. Neva already, uh, as Professor Neva already said. Uh, so I decided to leave uh, Russia for better pastures, but I continued to write, I continued uh, to walk uh, as a journalist, because nowadays it's possible. Uh, and actually, that's, that's maybe much more interesting uh, than to talk about me. It's interesting to talk about present Russia and what's happening to present Russia. Especially, uh, you know, tomorrow I was asked by a journalist a, very, uh, a question that is very often asked. And that was the question uh, that uh, Putin is usually presented in the West as a strong leader. Uh, I have many quotes about this. I can even, uh, you know, quote some. Uh, like, here is Farid Zakaria, uh, you know, the famous CNN commentator. Russian President Vladimir Putin is the most powerful man in the world. And uh, his Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, Putin has a strong spirit. And of course, last but not least, here comes Donald Trump. Of course, he is a strong leader. He is making mincemeat of our president. That was when Obama was president. Uh, so, you know, uh, I was always found surprising that there's a broad agreement. So there's Russian state-controlled media that says Mr. Putin is strong, and West says that he's a strong guy. 
And it's basically a very useful propaganda ploy to sell to Russians. And actually, it's, it's a useful line to sell to the hapless West. So what can we do with Mr. Putin? He's so strong. Uh, and so let me tell you one thing. Of course, Putin is strong when it comes to holding power. There is no dispute. He will never go away on his own. Uh, he's willing to shoot uh, any orange revolution. Uh, and uh, this is a big thing because uh, any revolution, the revolution really happens uh, not when a dictator starts shooting at the crowd, uh, but uh, when the crowd starts shooting back and the dictator gets cold feet. Uh, that's what happened to Yanukovych in Ukraine, and that's obviously what is not going to happen to Putin. But I just uh, want uh, to point out that uh, Putin is not really so strong as he is really violent, and that's a bit a tad, di a tad of difference. Uh, for instance, look at some of the most famous things he has done, some of the most famous crimes Russia has committed recently, like Skripal poisoning in uh, London. Uh, so let us ask a very simple question. Did Putin really want to create a first-scale international scandal? My guess is that he wanted to make an impression and he didn't want to be caught. And basically Skripal poisoning is a failed operation because what happened, he wanted to poison the father and uh, because the agents were of such a low quality that they poisoned also the daughter, he got caught. Uh, and uh, this is essentially a failed operation uh, that uh, testifies not only to the stubborn determination of Russian secret services to, heal, to kill uh, whomever they consider a traitor, uh, but also to the inability to do it professionally and without traces. Uh, the other important point I would like to make is that Mr. Putin does not risk a military confrontation with the West. This is a surprising thing to see because you can see that uh, this is Rogo who has embarked about, uh, upon a naked aggressive policy. Uh, but if you look carefully, then in all his enterprises, uh, be it Syria, uh, be it uh, Ukraine, uh, be it Georgia, uh, so Putin usually prefers uh, to use cutouts or so called volunteers. It's not so much a military intervention as black ops, and this means diminished responsibility. But it also means diminished control and uh, entails all sorts of unplanned consequences like shooting down Malaysia and Boeing, which unfortunately it's five years this week since this happened. Uh, and of course one can claim that this sort of black ops and cutouts testifies precisely to the deviousness with which Mr. Putin manipulates the West. Uh, but, uh, you know, but in the business Mr. Putin is currently in, that is in a power display designed to intimidate your neighbors, this sort of shyness can really be lethal because it makes your paper tiger. And we all very often, if you look very close, if we look very close, uh, closely, we can see Putin blinking. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a very telling story that happened last year in the April that's happened in Syria at a place called Deir Azor. There were two, uh, around 200 Russians who were advancing on Kurd positions and the Kurds were uh, also in league with Americans. Uh, and uh, Americans just wiped these Russian troops with airstrikes. And surprisingly in Russia, which is always saying a lot of things about the United States, how it's meddling uh, in Russian affairs, how it's financing uh, Russian opposition, blah, blah, blah. This time, uh, Putin did not squeak, uh, and then President Trump ordered the airstrikes against Assad. Russia made a great show, it issued a lot of warnings, uh, but in the end we were very careful not to shoot down a single U.S. missile, let alone to sink as U.S. ship how, uh, <coughs> as we promised. Uh, so, uh, whatever Mr. Putin says, his behavior makes it evident that he wants to avoid a direct military confrontation with the West. This means he is basically not in the league of Adolf Hitler. Uh, he does not want another Afghanistan. He does not want another war. He does not want a short victorious war, which he has ample grounds to believe will be neither short nor victorious. He wants basically a simulation, a TV war, with all the PR advantages of the war and none of its downsides. And basically, it's a fatal flaw in the strategy, 
that is designed to bring Russia in clash with the West because you really cannot go to war without being ready to go to war. Uh, for instance, when Adolf Hitler remilitarized the Rhine zone or next Austria, he meant business. He didn't want to go to war, but he would have gone if needs be. It was not just a bluff, and with Putin it is just bluff. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, what he does, in, as I've said, instead of uh, real war, he, means, uh, he, he tries to wage a hybrid war. Uh, and it's a new word which is very respected in certain circles, and there are lots of people say, oh, look at Putin, how he's manipulating us, how he's waging the hybrid war. Uh, but there's just one problem with the hybrid war, it can be won. Uh, the problem is that in a regular war, you get either money or some advantages or territory. In the hybrid war, you can wreak havoc with your enemies. But actually, uh, you do not get uh, any uh, advantages out of the hybrid war for yourself. And uh, if you can look at what has Putin done to Ukraine, at what he has done to Georgia, at his medal in meddling in, in U.S. elections, you can ask yourself, so what did Putin get out of it except psychological satisfaction? And the strange answer is, answer is that Russia has not benefited at all from all of these nefarious activities. Uh, and actually Putin became a sort of scarecrow and now he's uh, on his way to becoming uh, the head of a rock state. Uh, so you can ask, uh, why does not Putin build up the military? Uh, if he understands that his military will not stand up to the West, uh, why does he tolerate the inefficiency in the military? Uh, because Russian military is really not efficient and are feeding him fake videos and are feeding him fake tales. And it's really simple because the efficient military is first of all will be dangerous to Mr. Putin himself. So this is a choice he's facing. Uh, if he doesn't have efficient military, he cannot really confront the West. If he has efficient military, he's scared of them more than of anything else. Another thing that I want to point out is that uh, if you look at Putin you can, and you look at all his plans, you can strangely see that all his plans have failed. Uh, and that's one thing all strong men have in common is success. That's the whole point of being strong. Nobody ever heard of a strong loser. Uh, so the funny thing is that uh, uh, Putin is now really aggressive and people, since they don't have long memories, they tend to forget that back when he was elected in 1999, he was not thinking of confrontation with the West. He actually wanted to be a NATO member up to the Iraqi war. And when he was not accepted into the club as equal, uh, he had some other plans. Actually, one of his plans involved the nomination of the uh, Europe uh, by gas pipes. Because back, uh, say, 10 years ago, the biggest Kremlin catchword was energy superpower, and uh, Kremlin believed that Russian uh, gas supplies will be winning a victory that Soviet tanks failed to achieve. And, of course, uh, this plan has also failed, because you cannot be an energy superpower, you can be just a raw material supply. Uh, and what I'm basically trying to say that Putin turned to an open Berlin while he exhausted all his other options. He was not accepted as equal to the club because Russian economy, because of him, is growing weaker and weaker and he doesn't understand what's happening. He does not want a strong economy because he does not want businessmen who compete with him to power. And this means that Russia is economically growing weaker and he tries to resort to different subterfuges just in order to be uh, influential and instead he just becomes rogue. And that's precisely because maybe what I would like to finish this talk, what I'm trying to say, you know that uh, back, uh, that back in uh, uh, 1949, George Orwell published his famous dystopian novel, 1984, and he envisaged an Earth divided into three great totalitarian powers. Unfortunately, this bleak future did not materialize because the totalitarian powers 
They couldn't compete with the free world. They lost. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, every country in the world is free to join the great river of free market economy. But actually, a very strange thing is happening, because outside this great river of free economy, there are many nooks, crannies, and isolated marshes that came into existence. And uh, the dinosaurs that uh, strove to dominate the world, they perished. But there is, uh, you know, a new breed of small lizards, generation of failed neo-totalitarian states or neo-archaic states, which is coming to existence uh, not only just in Russia, in many Latin American countries, uh, even to some part in Hungary. Uh, and mostly these uh, states are not big and powerful, as it was depicted by Orwell. Uh, they're just mean and small. Uh, and they have several crucial differences between uh, their mighty... Uh, be, uh, there are several crucial differences between these states and their mighty princesses. For instance, uh, the totalitarian states of world, they wanted to conquer the world. And these uh, new neo-totalitarian states, they don't. In fact, they're incapable of existing without the free world uh, because they live by scrums. They get money by exporting raw materials and importing everything else. Their elite has bank accounts and real estates in the West. And obviously, you don't want to bomb Florida if you have just bought a penthouse here. <laughs> uh, so these guys, they don't want to destroy the free world. Their aggressive rhetoric is just for domestic consumption. There's also the thing that all totalitarian guys, they proclaimed its technical superiority over the West. The Soviet Union was saying that it will outshine all its rivals in science and technology. And uh, actually these delusions proved to be its undoing because people looked at the Soviet Union, looked at the West and said, hey guys, no deal, Soviet Union is not better, it's worse. Now, all these new ideologies, it may be the patriotic views uh, of those people that surround President Putin, it may be Islamic fundamentalism uh, in Near East, uh, they actually don't claim technical superiority. They claim moral superiority. They say, yes, our cultures, uh, we are poor, we're not successful, uh, but we're more spiritual. And of course, you know, you cannot really measure spirituality, so they may have something here when it comes, you know, to brainwashing. And also the previous generation of totalitarian states closed their borders because they needed the brains to stay inside, precisely in order to win over the West. And actually this new generation it keeps borders open because it's actually interested in squeezing out of country any independent businessman, writer or thinker. They want a stupid population that's easy to rule. And perhaps the last thing which is uh, very interesting is that these new states, it's actually a very old breed of a state where there is no separate, uh, you know, separate business, there is no business which can be separate from a state. Uh, where money is power and money is power. When you, uh, and uh, and uh, <laughs> money is power and uh, uh, power is money. Uh, when you can be an independent from state, because this way you diminish his power. So anybody who has business, he has uh, been handed aid by the state, or he is put in scrawny, or if he is really independent, any moment he can become uh, uh, the uh, he can he can be attacked uh, by the people surrounding Putin, and his business will perish. And actually, as I said, that's a very old breed of a state. Uh, the majority of uh, uh, old, uh, or the majority of human societies were built like this, with the exception of few democratic societies like Athenians or Romans, uh, with the exception of uh, several European societies. Uh, and the reasons these societies came out of existence because they couldn't compete with Europe in 19th and 20th century. Because, yes, uh, it was a stable model uh, that gave the rulers of the state uh, the monopoly not only over power, but also over wealth. Uh, but it could not compete militarily and economically right now. And what is the crucial difference is that any competition right now in the world is not solved militarily. 
uh, a country like Russia uh, would have been simply destroyed from the military point of view if it existed in the 19th century, if it was so inefficient. Like, you know, uh, many uh, countries in the Near East or in Asia were colonized by Westerners because they were inefficient. Now that the military option is ruled out, the neo-archaic states are back. And this is maybe why Putin may seem so strong, because uh, he provides a template. Because there are many rulers that are willing to follow into his steps, that are willing to create the same paradigm of money becoming power and power becoming money. So, this is what I wanted to say. <laughs> Eh bien, c'est le moment de continuer par des questions, s'il vous plaît. Euh, juste par rapport à votre dernière phrase, euh, est-ce que ce nouveau euh, « money is power » et « power is money » c'est vieux comme le monde Oui, c'est justement comme je dis, c'est vieux comme le monde. Euh, les... <laughs> je veux dire que Poutine n'a rien inventé là-dessus. Non, 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 il n'est pas un inventif type. As I said, that uh, you know, uh, the first uh, uh, since the first uh, kingdoms came into existence, I mean, territorial <coughs> kingdoms uh, like the Empire of Sargon the Great, uh, who conquered uh, actually more or less free Shumerian city states. This was the way of every ruler who used uh, who had a tight control over resources in order to distribute his resources among his friends, because he rightly believed that, first of all, his friends should be rewarded. And then, of course, if the resources are just uh, with, stay with his friends and not with his enemies and not with independence, this was, of course, will consolidate his power. So, uh, as I've said, uh, the Putin has not invented a new model. This is a very old model. But this is once again coming into existence because it could not exist uh, uh, very well in 19th or 20th century when uh, states like this were just made into colonies uh, by the West. Now it comes back into existence. Uh, Julia, tu n'as pas voulu répondre à la question concernant ton dernier projet, ton nouveau projet sur le christianisme ah, non, non, parce non, non. que tu avais autre chose à dire avant c'était très intéressant mais j'aimerais bien, peut-être ça peut être intéressant pour nous d'entendre de, quelques mots sur ton travail actuel, sur tes recherches sur peut-être euh, les raisons euh, euh, la motivation, pourquoi tu d'un coup tu t'es intéressé c'est certainement en lien avec la Russie actuelle peut-être ou pas du tout, pourquoi euh, Mais c'est précisément parce que ça n'a pas de sens, vous savez, comme je l'ai dit, parce que c'est un sujet incroyablement complexe. Et je n'ai pas voulu que le début de la christianité, je n'ai pas voulu que ça soit un amateur. Et d'un autre côté, ce n'est pas un sujet de 30 minutes de talk ou de 20 minutes de talk, et pas même un heure de talk. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I started, uh, as uh, Professor Neva said, uh, I'm initially not a writer. I'm initially the student, uh, the student of uh, uh, Vyacheslav Ivanov, uh, a famous Russian uh, um, culturologist, uh, for want of a better word, uh, one of the uh, major minds uh, on the Russian uh, landscape. Uh, land the intellectual landscape, uh, and he was always uh, very concerned that uh, I'm not doing any more science, I'm just uh, writing things. Uh, he was always expecting me to come back to science. And when things in Russia started looking not interesting, uh, I decided to follow his advice, uh, because uh, I was accustomed to, to write about heroes. Maybe wicked heroes, but heroes. And there was no heroes for me. There were no heroes anymore for me to describe. And uh, as I've said, Putin is very commonplace. Uh, so I started a big book on the history of the, uh, or a very 
a very old subject uh, of the decline and fall of Roman Empire. Uh, so, uh, because this always interested me and because I thought that I knew a lot about uh, this story. So while I was writing, I was realizing at the same time that Christianity uh, played an enormous role uh, in this fall, uh, even bigger than uh, Jibon was uh, describing. And so the focus of the book shifted to Christianity. And then since I was, uh, I'm sorry, maybe there are many people who are very, very serious believers are sitting in this uh, room and uh, what I'm doing has nothing to do with faith because faith and science are totally separate uh, things and you can believe in whatever you want. But I was just interested in a story, in a big story of fake news, uh, how uh, so the group of the followers of a Jewish millionaire's prophet uh, who was uh, executed by Romans, uh, how they didn't want to believe into his death, how they said to his followers, because they obviously <coughs> wanted to keep the organization alive and striving and have their position in this organization, uh, how they said to these followers that uh, he's going to come again very soon, uh, and uh, this coming again very soon uh, is uh, expected uh, for the last 2,000 years, and has not come back, and still people are waiting for him. And this is actually, I think, is a very successful uh, ideological construct uh, that, uh, you know, generated uh, some very important things uh, within the human psyche, uh, because it was believed. And I just wanted to, to uh, find out how it was constructed, how it was built, and uh, how it uh, was developing. Uh, so I'm sorry if I stepped on somebody's oh, standard stories, because, you know, as fake news go, uh, well, Soviet Union are just, uh, you know, small fries compared to Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and Putin is non-existent on this scale. <laughs> uh, I want to get back to, to Putin. I'm, I'm interested in your Christianity thing, too, but... Um, what do you think his grand strategy is uh, in, on the international scene vis-a-vis -vis Europe and America and so on? And it's the point, he doesn't have a strategy. Oh. Mm. Uh, because, you know, obviously, if you're thinking of uh, that uh, uh, one day he thinks, I will build the, the, the South Stream and will dominate Europe by supplying gas through the South Stream. And the very next day he annexes Crimea, and you know, this is uh, two very contradictory things. You can either annex Crimea or build South Stream. Actually, South Stream is not being built right now, precisely because of this. Uh, so obviously when Mr. Putin is taking some, uh, uh, he does not have an overall strategy and very often he reacts. I think what he has, he has uh, some, uh, mm, some beliefs. And these beliefs include his, uh, you know, firm belief. Uh, he's a FSB, he's a KGB, former KGB uh, officer. So what he was basically told by uh, his superiors uh, when he uh, was a KGB officer, that the West uh, is uh, a fake uh, society, uh, which has a window dressing of democracy, and behind this window dressing of democracy, there are some nefarious goings, uh, going in uh, between, uh, you know, businessmen uh, who are manipulating people and getting money out of, uh, of the people. Uh, so he built exactly the same type of society in Russia uh, immediately, and he really believed that uh, it is just as it is in the West. And when he was not accepted by the West, he was, uh, uh, he started thinking why it is, and he gave himself an answer. That's because they don't like me. That's because they are double standards. I built the society exactly of the same type as I was taught Western democracy is, and for some reason they don't accept me as equal. What it is, by what it is but double standards. So Putin is really physically convinced that's his problem then whenever there is a position against him, 
This is because it is financed by the West. Whenever there is a revolution in Ukraine, it's because it is financed by the West. In his point of view, when he annexed Crimea, how it crazy it may sound, he was just retaliating. He could not lose face. He was thinking that, you know, the Western guys, Europe and United States, they took Ukraine away from him. So he has to do something in return. And, uh, well, he never gets understood for some reason. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My question is linked to the former uh, questioner. It's about Venezuela and the 300,000, the 300,000, I don't know if the figure is correct, that's what I could have been press, 300,000 Russian troops in Venezuela. No, first of all, certainly not 300,000. No, 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 no way. No way. 300,000, it's, it's, I think, about a third of Russian army. Uh, we no. don't have that much standing army that is capable of fighting. There are certainly Russian, uh, that, that's part of his overall strategy. Uh, you know, uh, I think that actually Putin played in Venezuela a big role. I think without him, Maduro would have gone. And we'll had rumors about Maduro's plane sitting uh, in the airport, ready to take off. Uh, and uh, I think it was precisely Putin who dissuaded him from running, among other things. Of course, I don't think that Maduro was that willing to run. Uh, so basically, Putin's strategy is very simple. Uh, he's willing to um, be friends. And he's willing to support uh, any regime uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is hostile to the West, that is hostile to the United States especially. Uh, and you know, uh, basically the regimes that are hostile to the uh, uh, free world are not good regimes, are not sound regimes, uh, and are not prosperous regimes. So Mr. Putin finds himself in the, uh, in the company of outcasts because really what he's trying to do while there are, you know, uh, normal countries uh, talking to each other, there's Mr. Putin who has his own club of his favorite leaders like uh, North Korea, Venezuela, Sudan. Uh, he very much supported Sudan and uh, Omar al-Bashir until he was, uh, you know, uh, Overthrown. He supported Robert Mugabe. So, took any guy whom Putin supports, and you'll find a scoundrel. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's just the way it is. And of course, his ability uh, to support these guys is limited by the fact that Russia doesn't have that many resources. The Russian economy is smaller than the economy of a single state of California. The Russian economy is smaller than the economy of a single state of New York. And it, or single city of New York and a single state of Texas. So obviously, uh, you can commit some resources, just like Iran uh, is willing to commit a lot of resources uh, to support terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. And his uh, and Iranian citizens are not having much to eat. Uh, but uh, still, this limits you, Monsieur. Uh, Putin is not the only actor in Russia. What is the position of the church in the power structure in Russia? Uh, you know, uh, I would disagree strongly. Uh, Putin is the only serious actor in Russia. And uh, Putin is the only guy who is responsible for Russian international policy. Uh, Putin may delegate his authority in order to proclaim his nonsense, like, say, in Ukraine. But it's obviously that the war in Ukraine was decided upon by Mr. Putin, and only by Mr. Putin, and only even his closest friends were against the war. He said, no, I am going to take Crimea. Uh, there is only one guy who is an exception, that's the president of Chechnya, Mr. Kadyrov. Uh, but it's too complicated a story to go into uh, here. 
Mr. Kadyrov, uh, Chechnya is not ruled by Putin, this is true. And this is also a great challenge to everybody who says that Mr. Putin is strong, because how can you be strong if you uh, are not ruling a, a considerable part of your territory? Uh, but otherwise, as I said, uh, when it comes to international politics, when it comes to supporting Venezuela or supporting Sudan or whatever, this is certainly only Putin who decides. Uh, the role of church is precisely zero, uh, because what Putin tried to do, he tried to use church uh, to increase his influence. Uh, now, since the church does not have much influence in Russian society, uh, the only thing that happened is that uh, church used a lot of uh, the resources that was supplied by Mr. Putin in order to increase its wealth and corruption. This did not add to the popularity of the church. So as a political factor, church in Russian society is, extreme, is precisely zero. Um. Je vais parler en français, oui. parce que moi j'ai peur que mon anglais dit. Comment réagit maintenant la population Parce que l'économie, à un moment donné, il me semble, elle montait hein, tout de suite. Et puis maintenant, c'est un petit peu en chute libre. Est-ce qu'il y a au niveau de, des, du peuple véritablement, comment il réagit actuellement Ok, c'est une bonne question, parce que je pense que maintenant, ce que nous voyons en Russie, we see a transition between what can be called authoritarian regime and what can be uh, termed uh, dictatorship proper. Uh, one uh, point, uh, so we can see several stages in uh, Putin's uh, presidency. Uh, first, he was ruling, of course, as a leader of, uh, as a democratically elected leader. Uh, I mean, uh, these elections were a little bit fudged. There was pressure, political pressure. Uh, there were, you know, uh, fake uh, voters. Uh, uh, there was a position that was uh, uh, that uh, did not have the ability to speak directly to people. Things like this. But still, uh, like many other authoritarian leaders, uh, Putin was democratically elected. And he has the support of the majority of the people. Uh, at this time, also, Putin was uh, definitely a favorite with Russian elite. Uh, this was the time when there was plenty of oil, when the prices were high, and uh, when Russian economy was uh, still buoyed, buoyed? Buoyed by... Uh, by, uh, by the fact uh, the oil prices are high, there's plenty of money, everybody was living of it. Uh, small managers, uh, people who did, were not very much interested in politics uh, and were just content with uh, having the possibility of uh, vote revocation to Turkey, things like this. Uh, this thing en ended in uh, year 2014, after Crimea annexion, uh, when the prices of oil went down, uh, and when Putin switched from being uh, the president who is popular with the Russian elite to a president who is popular just with a regular voter. Because uh, there is a very interesting effect that is very much underestimated when it comes to democracy, especially democracy in poor countries. If you have uh, the voter who is rich, he starts thinking. If you have a voter who is poor, and especially dirt poor, he just believes in the savior and he votes for a savior. And this is what Putin was trying to do. Uh, the Russian people who were getting poorer and poorer, and you could not explain to them what's happening with the economy, but you could explain to them that Russia is surrounded by enemies, and Putin is saving all us from the enemies, and maybe we are poor, but we are now respected and we are strong. Okay, people were buying this for some time. And of course, even in year 2018, Putin was uh, really an elected president. I mean, people voted for him. As I said, the elections were fudged. Uh, there would have been a second tour, but Putin clearly had a majority. 
All right, now we see a very important situation is developing right now with elections in, uh, in a very small legislative body, which is actually just uh, Moscow parliament, which is nothing. But what happened is that opposition uh, had several candidates who were running for this pretty parliament, which decides nothing. And suddenly the authorities realized it is going to win. It is going to win, it, was, it is going to be a landslide for that position. Uh, so basically they uh, conserved the registration of all the, uh, of all the opposition uh, uh, candidates that were likely to win. Uh, and this signifies the transition to a new stage. When Putin cannot really right now say that people vote for him. Uh, people are not voting for him, people are not voting for his party, uh, people are not voting, uh, people are not buying into his lies. Uh, obviously this means nothing good for Russia, uh, because when Putin was really popular, or even medium popular, he tolerated a lot of dissent, uh, he tolerated uh, programs I make, uh, he tolerated articles I write, because this still had not that big a resonance. Now, uh, while the less Putin's popularity, the more severe will be the measures he takes against everybody he perceives as his enemies. So we are coming, I think, in Russia to a true dictatorship in a classical sense of the world. La première question, j'aimerais savoir si Vladimir Poutine invite officiellement des, des chefs d'État étrangers ou des ministres russes dans son palais de la mer Noire. Ah, le palais de Gelingic. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know the name of the, the palace. Uh, no, because there are many. Oh, there is a, there is a big one near, near, near Sochi. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the problem with Russia. You know, I was recently studied the question and I uh, discovered that actually American president has only two official residences. This is White House and Camp David. <laughs> and, you know, I started thinking that in terms of palaces, Russia is really a superpower <laughs> as compared to the United States. Because Putin has dozens, <laughs> almost in every Russian region. Uh, yes, there was uh, a very big uh, scandal that was connected to one of these because it was built as private residence. Uh, it was uh, literally built, uh, it literally cost a billion of dollars. Uh, and what's more, there was a nail strip built with public money nearby, and it was used only by Putin, despite the fact that it was public nail strip. <laughs> and it was another billion of dollars. Uh, and uh, the villagers near uh, this palace, they didn't have gas, for instance. Uh, so it was a little bit of shame. Uh, but there are many, as I said, such uh, palaces, and uh, Mr. Putin usually prefers his official residence, uh, and uh, uh, when it when it comes to to to, to Sochi, which is which he likes because it's southern, it's, it's the climate is better than in Moscow. It's almost like here. Uh, so yes, he does invite a lot of uh, foreign uh, a lot of foreign presidents and prime ministers. His problem is that nobody is coming for several years. Except people like Robert Mugabe and <laughs> other nice guys. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, several uh, big say in in year two thousand. I think it happened in year two thousand five. Yes, it was the anniversary of the victory, uh, Victory Day in the Second World War, which we Russians celebrate on the 9th of May. There was a big parade and there were many uh, foreign leaders, including the American president, who came to this parade. And one of the reasons actually they came, uh, because uh, this was the day of the uh, uh, end of trial of Mr. Khodorkovsky, the famous Russian businessman, who was the first uh, big businessman arrested mm -hmm. by Mr. Putin in order to dismantle his empire and in order to show Russian businessmen their place. Uh, and everybody understood that Khodorkovsky is arrested for political reasons. And there was a lot of talks going back and forth. 
uh, among Putin uh, and um, uh, among uh, foreign representatives and the officials of the Putin government. And they were assured that Mr. Khodorkovsky will have a lenient sentence. So they came to the May demonstration and Putin held sentencing until the demonstration has passed. And after this, Khodorkovsky got, I forgot what he, 12 years or something like this. 10 years. So it was, uh, it was, you know, uh, basically it was a political fraud. I am not saying that this was a very uh, influential, uh, a very big story. But this, uh, you know, I guess that many Western leaders for the first time started thinking about Mr. Putin and uh, what he really does. Because Angela Merkel was precisely coming because Putin said this is not going to be so severe, Mr. Khodorkovsky will, uh, will be free or something like this. It was intimated, if not said. And uh, uh, it was not only this, of course, but what I'm saying that uh, in year 2005 all the Western leaders were there and it was a great show with Mr. Putin. And last year, nobody was there except, as I've said, as a couple of, uh, I think, uh, Belarusian President Lukashenko, uh, a couple of the guys uh, like this Venezuelan guy, and there was another important guy who came, and I think he did a great job of coming. There was Benjamin Netanyahu who came. <laughs> but the story of Benjamin Netanyahu had a very great consequence. Because why did Netanyahu came and what happened later? So Netanyahu comes to this nine of May celebration, and this is very very important to Putin because he he wants to be accepted as one of the equals. So Netanyahu came, of course scored a lot of points by coming. Then they talk a bit, and probably they were discussing, I think, uh, Russian air missile defense, air defense. Uh, in Syria, uh, because uh, there was uh, <coughs> all these uh, 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 air missile systems were either in the head of Syrians or in the head of Iranians. And Israelis are very fearful, especially of Iranians coming to their border. So uh, Netanyahu came on the comes on the 9th of May. <coughs> And on the 10th of May next year, Netanyahu comes back, and the Russian and the Israeli uh, and the Israeli air force just, you know, raises to the ground of his defense, supplied by Russia, and Russia makes not a squeak. And of course, it is very interesting because it was a very humiliating show, especially to people who follow the military uh, events that all these anti-air missiles proved absolutely defenseless against Russian, uh, against Israeli aviation. So first of all, this was a humiliating show of uh, Israeli military superiority. There was the second point that Russia did make a squeak. And of course, it did not make a squeak because for Putin it was more important that Benjamin Netanyahu came to him called out to him, walked with him in Moscow, and then maybe he asked, don't you mind? Oh no, probably I don't mind. Peut-être une dernière question, madame, oui. I'm really curious to know what you think about the relationship between Trump and Putin. Does Putin have Trump intuitions and there's no interpreters and no, well, they have an interpreter, but they have no journalists around, no, um, Diplomats or anybody with them. Oh, I think this connection between Trump and Putin is certainly overhyped. Uh, I think that the reason Trump was, uh, you know, saying so many good uh, words about Mr. Putin before the election, which was rather strange, because uh, Mr. Trump was, you know, uh, saying bad things about everybody except Mr. Putin. Yeah. And I was always wondering why is this? Mm -hmm. Uh, so after I read murder report, I actually a little before I found my answer because uh, you know Trump has uh, had these development projects in Moscow. Mm. Uh, they were nearly dead. To, yeah. to tell the truth, by the uh, 2014 uh, they were shelved. 
Uh, but still, Trump was keeping them on the back burner. And because uh, he's a businessman and because he probably expected uh, that he can possibly lose the election, uh, he, why would he, you know, uh, uh, load it on to Mr. Putin if he can come back to Moscow and uh, uh, put in play and build a couple of skyscrapers? Uh, so this is this is my uh, my explanation. What uh, why Trump was not saying so many dirt, uh, so many dirty things of Mr. Putin. The other thing is that I think they, of course, these two have psychological affinity. Uh, this is very important because I was talking of this, uh, you know, this new breed of rulers uh, that uh, are not up to the previous Western standards of uh, democracy. Trump is basically built along the same lines as Putin or the Hungarian president, Mr. Orban. It's obvious that he is uh, very... He, he, cannot run his, he cannot run American state as he runs his company, but basically this is the man who would like to run his state as he runs his company. Uh, so this is the second question. The third point is, of course, Mr. Putin, of course, was trying to meddle into uh, American elections. Uh, but I think it will be, uh, uh, you know, Russia is not able to do many things. Russia was not able to, you know, uh, make a coup d'etat in Montenegro. Russia, uh, you know, it will be... A, Strange thing to claim that a country that could not make a coup d'etat in Montenegro and that could not, uh, you know, annex uh, half of Ukraine as it wanted was able to seriously meddle uh, into uh, American elections. Uh, I mean, was able to influence the real outcome. <coughs> I mean, it wanted to, yes, of course, but you know. Wanting and doing are two completely different kinds of uh, stuff. Uh, so uh, what I also really believe is that the story of uh, Putin uh, colliding with Trump was overhyped, was oversold uh, by Democratic Party, uh, was oversold uh, by people like Comey, uh, who were partly responsible for it in the first place, and it is precisely oh, this story oh, that is wreaking uh, havoc in America. Because uh, basically Putin did not, uh, this is a very important thing, that uh, Putin, uh, I'm not sure he was, uh, he was rooting so much for Trump, probably yes, because he saw a psychological affinity, but if we look into activities of Russian trolls, they were not so much rooting for one particular guy, as they were trying to solve chaos. They were upholding Black Lives Matter, and at the same time, they upholding white supremacist groups. They were upholding, you know, uh, uh, everybody against everybody. They were upholding Bernie Sanders against Clinton. They were upholding Trump against Clinton. The moment Trump was elected, the first Russian Facebook troll operation, which was successful. I think Trump was elected somewhere on the 9th of November, no? Somewhere on the 8th of November. And I think on the 10th of November or 12th, something like this, there was a demonstration. Uh, Michael Moore uh, participated in it, the famous filmmaker. Actually, it was the one staged by Russian trolls, and it was a demonstration against Trump. So Trump did nothing, but they already mm -hmm. organized a demonstration against Trump. What I mean is that Russian desire was to wreak havoc with the American political system. The reason they were supporting Trump, they were thinking that this is the best instrument to wreak havoc with the American political system. And I'm sorry to say that the reason Russia succeeded because there is havoc is precisely because Democrats started using it as a tool against Trump. So Putin succeeded beyond his wildest dreams but not because he's so cunning, but because of the internal American political situation. Peut-être je vais me permettre de poser une dernière question à Yulia Leonidovna. I'm not sure to you will agree with me. I'm not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> oui, oui. 
Merci, excusez-moi. Vous vouliez poser une question Non, non, non. Ah, non, non, non. Merci. Quant à la fin du régime soviétique, euh, beaucoup connu, euh, le sociologue, euh, l'auteur des auteurs béant, ou Ziyech Wessot et Alexandre Zinoïev, à la question euh, quand est-ce que le régime connaîtra une fin, il avait une réponse jamais. Il est là pour mille ans. Un an après, euh, c'était fini. Euh, bon, évidemment, pour le régime du président Poutine, on ne peut pas répondre il est là pour mille ans, parce qu'il y a des limites euh, biologiques, bien entendu. Euh, mais quand même, j'aimerais savoir un peu plus précisément le diagnostic pronostic euh, de Yulia Latinina. Il me semble, à moi personnellement, que s'il y a un échec, sans parler de l'économie, du président Poutine, c'est euh, la perte de l'Ukraine. Il y a eu cet échec pendant au 19e siècle où deux empereurs ont écrasé les Polonais, d'abord Nicolas Ier et ensuite le tsar libérateur Alexandre. C'était une erreur qui a coûté, si vous voulez, euh, cinq générations de détestation entre les Polonais et la Russie. J'ai peur que nous entrions dans le même cycle pour peut-être quatre ou cinq générations entre les Ukrainiens et les Russes. Vous êtes allé à Kiev, vous avez participé à des événements politiques à Kiev, est-ce que vous pourriez brièvement nous dire votre pronostic à ce sujet Non, vous avez absolument raison. Je pense que ce que Poutine fait, c'est en parlant de la chance versus les choses faillées, c'est qu'il est. Vous savez, le soviet, le russien empire, est mort sous le régime de la troisième fois. Je veux dire, la première fois, il est mort sous les bolcheviques. Uh, the second time uh, it was uh, fell apart in year 1991, uh, and as, the, as every former empire, uh, the metropole retained uh, some degree of cultural influence over its uh, former parts. And uh, if it was uh, sustainable, it was quite sustainable, it would have been possible that Russian would have been used as a language, a mutual language, in which uh, all these former parts were still speaking. If Russian economy would have been strong, if Russian uh, universities would have been great to study in, uh, then the metropolitan would have kept this influence, which is not a bad thing. What we see right now is that uh, Putin, after his annexation of Crimea, after the war he is making in Ukraine, Well, he got Crimea, he lost Ukraine. Ukraine is going to become a Western country. Russia, right now, is going back to the East. So these two big uh, territories, they diverge, like, you know, to big land masses when they like continents drifting apart. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely right, so this will be a generational thing. I'm not sure this rift will ever heal to Uh, uh, I'm not sure this rift will kill soon. Yeah. Il est peut-être temps de mettre fin et euh, la géopolitique, comme vous avez entendu, est entrée dans ce salon. <rire> et de remercier Yula pour cette soirée. Merci Yula.